I uh, just want to thank everyone for, for being here today. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can all get a picture of these disclosure slides that we want to share. Is that uh, sharing okay, Kevin? Great. So hope that uh, everyone is doing well. Uh, we are uh, honored to have uh, uh, Ann Niendorf of the University of Wisconsin with us today. And uh, she is going to share uh, with us information on the senior guest auditing program. And the way that uh, I had an introduction to Ann is one of my clients uh, has uh, really dove in and used this program a lot uh, with topics of interest that he wanted to learn more about and and just had a, a wonderful uh, experience with this uh, auditing program. So we're very fortunate to have Anne who uh, is going to tell us all about that today. And I like to uh, usually start out by uh, giving a joke or two about our topic. And since this is more education-based, Kevin, I just wanted to tell you, I, I caught my son eating his math homework. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I asked him why, he said, it's because this teacher said it was a piece of cake. <laughs> nice. And Kevin, why, why did the music teacher uh, need a ladder? Why is that? Why? <laughs> to hit the high notes. Come on, Kevin. <laughs> All right, so... I'm done with my dad humor, but uh, my kids didn't like that humor as well, but I can hear all of you laughing uh, internally right now. So as we go through this Zoom, feel free to, to move the, the pictures around. Uh, I just shared with you some uh, disclosure slides that, um, uh, that are important for us to share. And uh, with that being said, I just want to uh, give a reminder on Wednesday, August 23rd, we're going to be hosting our next webinar on taxes. So if uh, if that is of interest, we would welcome your attendance, uh, but be on the lookout for invites uh, coming uh, in the, the near future on that. So before Kevin and I turn it over uh, to Anne, just wanted to, to give you an update on uh, some information about the, the current markets. Uh, some of this information here that we're reviewing is, is through the end of June. But what you're looking at right now is a chart of the S&P 500 uh, dating back to or from 1996 uh, through the end of June. So at the left hand column, you can see the run up in the latter 90s. Then we had the, the dot com bubble burst 9-11 in there from 2000 to uh, 02. Then we had the run up before the, o, the October 9th, 07 start of that market drop which was the second biggest drop in stock market history, ended on March 9th, 09. Then we had a very long run up uh, through February of 2020 when we saw the COVID drop, a uh, 34% uh, drop in 33 days. So that was the quickest 34% drop in history. Bottomed out March 23rd of 2020. Had a nice run up through the beginning of last year, January 3rd, 2022. Uh, at which time uh, we went down 25% last year with the bottom being around October 12th. So since October 12th, the market's actually up 24%. So that is the, the current bottom of the market. And the rise here that, that we've seen, uh, especially year to date, is a little deceiving uh, in the sense that um, you're looking at the S&P 500, the 500 largest US stocks, as I mentioned, but really seven of those 500 stocks has led to a, the lion's share of the rate of return. So through June, uh, the S&P 500 uh, year to date was up around 15%. But if you take out the seven uh, largest stocks, uh, it, the S&P was up maybe around 4%. So it really has been led by some major stocks, NVIDIA, um, Facebook, Tesla, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, uh, some of those really bigger stocks that have benefited by the artificial intelligence craze 
has really been uh, driving this market forward, but the, the lion's share of stocks really are, are, are more uh, on a flat basis year to date. NVIDIA is up 205% year to date. Facebook's up 142. Tesla's up 118. So those are some really big rate of returns that's, that's driving the S&P 500 right now. So we don't want our clients to expect the same types of rate of returns as the S&P 500 right now, unless all of their money is in tech stocks, which we would certainly not suggest. As we look at uh, valuations, the blue line that you see here is the, the long-term average uh, stock valuation in the S&P 500. So the red line is where we're at today based on forward price to earnings ratio. So anything above this blue line means um, the market is above that long-term average. We're getting to a point where we're about one standard deviation higher than that. Albeit we're not, the market isn't as expensive as it was um, uh, just about a year or so ago when we were almost two standard deviations higher. So as you get higher on this chart, you want to temper your expectations about future rate of returns in the market because the market's not as, as cheap to get those rate of returns. Uh, but today we're sitting here um, at this valuation on June 30th. And ultimately uh, what that would lead us to say is the the market's not necessarily expensive, but it's also not not cheap right now. Uh, certainly a lot of the um, uh, future market returns has to do with uh, potential recession and, and where that's going here in, in the coming months. If we look at uh, our day-to-day -day discussions with clients, a lot of our conversations will talk about growth stocks versus value stocks. Uh, those are two major types of investment styles. We had a long domination from around 2015 through the end of 2021, where growth stocks beat everything by a very wide margin. Um, then in 2021, that, that flipped, um, sorry, more around 2022, where value started to do better than growth. This year, growth is back in favor over value, but Ultimately, if you look at the history of growth versus value dating back to 1984, if you look at that middle line there, if the blue is above the middle line, it means value stocks are doing better. If the blue is below that middle line, it means growth stocks are doing better. And you can see there's periods of time where value outperforms and growth outperforms. Ultimately, our goal is to have a mixture of both. Um, even though a lot of times people are saying, well, gosh, why can't I have more growth stocks that are doing so well? To that, we would say uh, they were doing well now, but they're not always going to be in favor. So we really want to uh, help with that diversification discussion as we look at clients' portfolios. Uh, last slide before I turn it over to Kevin. Uh, this basically looks at the S&P calendar year rate of returns. That's the red uh, numbers on those, uh, the graph that you're looking at here dating back to 1993. So if we look at 2023 year to date, um, you can see the market's up 16%. Last year, uh, the market was down 19%. 2021 market was up 27%. So those are the calendar year, January 1st to December 31st rate of returns. But that blue dot is important because the blue dot will basically signify at its worst point in that calendar year, how low had the market gone uh, from its peak. So you can see um, these different blue lines, minus 8% this year, minus 25, minus 5, minus 34. There's always periods of volatility, even in the good years. And if you look at the average intra-year drop dating back to 1993, sometime on average, the market falls 15% in any given calendar year. That's just the norm. Uh, and that's where stock investing can drive people crazy because of that volatility. But the key is thinking more cycles, more longer term, more than just one year periods of time. Because we're at a point right now where 2022, that, that was not a fun market, both for stocks and for bonds. Um, but eventually we'll get back into a bull market where um, the, the stocks are, are, are leading the way. Just that um, sometimes you have to wait longer than, than you want. But patience is, is really the key here. 
So at this point, uh, Kevin, I'll ask you to unmute and uh, you can take it from here and then introduce Anne. Thanks. Excellent, John. Appreciate that. Well, following John's market update, I wanted to touch on three items that are likely on your minds. First, the question of are we nearing the end of the fight against inflation? And second, how will the Fed go about balancing inflation with emerging financial stability? And then thirdly, looking at potential outcomes of the U.S. economy this year. So to help better answer the question about how close we are to ending the fight against inflation, I thought starting with some background on what caused inflation to spike back in 2021 would be a pretty good starting point. So back in 2020, as the federal government was trying to deal with the economic repercussions brought on by COVID, they made a bunch of changes. They made changes to the child tax credit, to unemployment insurance, uh, food assistance, health, housing programs, and they started offering additional grants, loans, tax breaks, with an all-in cost reaching around $4 trillion. And then at the same time, the Federal Reserve lowered the federal funds rate to 0% to help spur economic activity. So between the federal government support and the low interest rate environment, the economy stayed reasonably solid, prompting strong demand that was really met with uh, global supply chain disruptions. So because of these reasons, year over year inflation really started to spike. So what you can see in the chart with inflation increasing by 5.4% in September of 2021, then year over year inflation increased by 7% in December of 2021, and then it peaked at 9.1% in June of 2022. Now to help deal with inflation in March of 2022, the Federal Reserve started the first of 10 rate hikes with the goal to bring down inflation to their 2% target. So far, the rate hikes have worked pretty well with inflation during the past year dropping from 9.1% to 3% most recently. So with that said, even though we have dropped to 3%, it is likely that we will not see rates come down to the Federal Reserve's target rate of 2% for a while yet. And that's due to the demand, so essentially to the lag in the shelter and housing cost reductions. So because as many housing contracts are on annual rental uh, basis is how they're set up. So with this in mind, we'll most likely not end the year below the Federal Reserve's 2% uh, year over year inflation target, but you know, certainly time will tell. All right, so the next slide, as we look ahead, the Fed is trying to balance out the need for higher interest rates with the Fed funds rate currently at five and a quarter percent and helping to slow down inflation while not raising interest rates too much is that could really cause some financial instability. So this slide shows how market expectations surrounding future changes in interest rates by the Federal Reserve have dramatically changed within even a few weeks' time. If you look back in early March, for instance, the market estimated future rates to climb a bit higher and end up in the mid-5% by year-end, and helping to continue to deal with the elevated inflation and also the labor market strength. Then, following the banking sector stress a few weeks or two later, the year-end rate estimate dropped down to the mid-threes. Lastly, after the regulators came in to support the banking sector a few weeks later, the year-end rate expectation jumped back up to under 5%, again, to help deal with persistent inflation. So as you can see, where interest rates will end up this year is, is certainly a moving target. Now, when we think of potential outcomes of the economy this year in the U.S., there are three main scenarios. First is a hard landing, meaning we go into a deep recession. Second, a soft landing, landing rather, meaning a mild or no recession. And then thirdly, no landing, meaning there is no recession in the near term. So if we were to have a hard landing, that would mean a few things, such as inflation drops would be minimal, the, the Fed may have raised interest rates too much, prompting subsequent cuts, a spike in unemployment, consumer spending slows along with more delinquencies, running debts, the economy shrinks, and a significant amount of price volatility in the market. If we were to have a soft landing, that would mean things like inflation would go back to pre-2022 levels, a pause in interest rate hikes, some increase in unemployment without a spike while job openings decline, moderate spending reductions, uh, the economy growing slowly and market stability. 
Now, the Olympics could conclude things like inflation remaining high, even with the Fed increasing interest rates, uh, higher interest rates for longer term. Uh, the tight, la tight labor market absorbs the rate increases, uh, resilient spending lending to sticky inflation. Uh, we also could have continued economic growth with the recession concern lingering and increased market volatility. Now, when we think of a best case scenario, we look to the soft landing, which is certainly an option that's still on the table. And it's looking you know, likely, but time will tell. So with that said, no matter which of these three outcomes comes to be, we here at the Capital Group help our clients plan for all of the above scenarios. And then we do this through our comprehensive financial planning process, uh, which includes ongoing stress testing of our clients' financial pictures. Now, if you or others know, you know, if you know of others who could benefit from this type of financial planning work that we do, uh, please feel free to have them reach out to John or myself. So to transition to our future topic today, uh, retiree education learning opportunities, I, we are very happy to introduce Ann Niendorf, who is in charge of the Senior Guest Auditing Program at UW-Madison. With our large retiree clientele, we are very excited for all of you to hear what Ann has to say. So with that said, Ann, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today and giving me thanks to John and Kevin for giving me the opportunity to present today. I appreciate that um, and reaching out to me to do so. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so let me just do that for one second. There we go. Let me see if I can. And... Sometimes, okay, I think we're good there. This one, okay. All right. I can see that screen. Thanks, Sam. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, uh, again, um, as uh, Kim and John introduced, uh, my name is Ann Niedorf. I'm the academic advisor for senior guest auditors at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, and I'm going to be doing a uh, senior guest auditing overview for all of you today. All right. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to introduce myself um, and get and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a first generation of returning adult student. I'm not currently a student, but I have been a returning adult student. <laughs> um, my educational background, I uh, have a Bachelor of Science in Human Services from UW Oshkosh, a uh, graduate certificate in support of services for online students in higher education from UW Milwaukee. Um, I got my bachelor's in 2016 and I got the certificate in 2020. Um, I'm originally from the Fox Valley area. I grew up in Oshkosh and I moved to Madison in 2004. I have worked with senior guests since 2014. Um, in 2014, I started out as a frontline staff at the Adult Career and Special Student Services Office, um, and I currently oversee admissions and enrollment for approximately 850 senior guest auditors at UW-Madison for fall and spring terms. And I also, um, as another part of my job, um, I serve as a committee chair for the returning, uh, returning adult student scholarships that are administered through our office. All right. Um, I wanted to give, um, with my agenda here, a brief overview of the Division of Continuing Studies. Um, with the Adult Career and Special Student Services Office in mind, uh, we are more than just senior guest auditing. We have there's a lot more to our office that I'll go over, um, and then I want to also talk about what is why I'm here today. Of course, what is senior guest auditing? Uh, the history of senior guest auditing, um, senior guest auditing specifics, and then um, how to become a senior guest auditor. And then at the end, we'll have uh, question and answers. Okay, so um, our office, um, we're located at um, 21 North Park Street, in which you can see the building in my prior, prior slide. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, we're near the corner of Park and Regent. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Madison area, um, there was a uh, Frabonis and a Buckingham's on Regent there, on Re near Regent and Park. And our building is was right behind it. Right now, a 10-story apartment building is being built there. <laughs> um, so there's a little construction going on outside our building. Um, 
I'm currently at home, as you can see, I do work from home um, four days a week um, until it gets closer to semester. And then I do come in and um, uh, am available uh, during the beginning of the semester um, at, at that time. So um, I, uh, our office is a gateway and access point for returning adult students and not only um, senior guest auditors, but um, anybody uh, looking to uh, go back to, to school um, as an adult. Um, we do admissions advising, advising, and we are the admissions advising and dean's office for 14 different categories of non-degree students. We also call them special students. Um, so to give you a little idea of the types of students, I won't go through all 14, but I'll at least tell you a few examples of um, other students other than senior guests and guest auditors. We also serve visiting international students. We serve um, students who are interested in going back to um, school, uh, to grad school, but need to take prerequisites in order to apply for grad school. We also admit students who want prof professional development um, uh, to take courses for professional development. So that's another area in which um, we um, do the admissions for, for students. Um, I believe we are one of five admissions offices on campus, if I'm not mistaken. So I apologize, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, we also have, uh, have people who do recruitment and enrollment coaching for online undergraduate degrees and professional degrees and capstone certificates um, in our office. And um, again, we do the scholarships and continuing education grants for returning adult students. And like I mentioned before, I do oversee that process. Um, and then I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, again, on the, along the lines of the different things we do in our office, um, is for services and programs for non-traditional students, um, because we, we do want to try to make UW accessible um, to uh, returning adult students. Uh, and one of those things that, one of the ways that we do that is um, through a program called Badger Ready. Um, it's kind of one of our shining stars. <laughs> so I do like to highlight that. Um, it is a program that is for students who um, would not, for potential transfer students, um, students who would not be um, academically competitive um, to return to, uh, to come to UW. Um, and an example of that would be if somebody, uh, let's say they were they did, took classes maybe a couple of years of college um, somewhere else, not UW, but somebody somewhere else when maybe one of the other UW system schools or um, a school in a different state. And then they find themselves in Madison and they want to um, they want to go to UW and they and they try to transfer in. Um, one part of that is um, they find because they when they were 18, 19, 20 years old, um, they maybe for whatever reason did not um, they didn't, they didn't participate or they didn't, um, how can I say it? They didn't uh, get the best of grades, <laughs> basically. And for whatever reason, they stopped out of school. Um, so there'd be lots of reasons. And when you're that age, sometimes life happens and um, you don't realize, um, you know, what what's going on at the time and you need to take a break, whatever the case may be. And so um, what our, this Badger Ready program does is um, it, uh, through an application process can actually take on students um, who maybe 5, 10, 20 years ago, um, they didn't complete school um, and they, through our office, we can help make them um, academically competitive. And basically they take about 12 credits as a st special student and then they're able to transfer in. Um, so before this program, if somebody came in with not the best grades, but they were from 10, 20 years ago, um, and didn't have a great GPA, it would be very difficult to transfer into to UW. So this is kind of one of our programs that we really um, like to highlight um, as far as accessibility to people in uh, Madison and, and to uh, returning adult students in general. So, all right. So the big question um, that everyone's probably been waiting for, what is senior guest auditing? <laughs> so senior guest auditing is, um, so it's for um, 
uh, Wisconsin residents age 60 and older um, who apply and are admitted to, and, and what the nice thing about this is any UW system, campus or state college, um, so you can audit courses for free. Um, I oversee UW Madison. Every school and college um, does their own technical college and UW state system schools um, do their own admissions for their senior guest auditor program. Um, but what's nice is that that is a, um, something that is available at all the UW system schools and tech state technical colleges across Wisconsin. Wisconsin residency status is determined by the UW Madison Office of the Registrar, residents uh, for tuition specialists. Um, auditing is defined as sitting in a lecture course and not actively participating, doing homework, or taking examinations. So it's basically um, all the things people typically didn't like to do, which was the homework and exams. <laughs> Take that out of the equation, and then you can sit in and um, listen to lecture and um, it, 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 you know, it, at your leisure. Um, some of, there are some exceptions to not, to participating, and that's just going to depend on the instructor's preference, but uh, we do give the minimal guidelines of, you kind of are fly on the wall, basically, and you sit in and you, and you listen to the lecture um, that a lot of senior guests do lecture courses of interests that they have or, and or classes that they didn't get a chance to take while they were undergraduates. Um, Auditors are not graded and they do not receive credit for auditing. So that's something we always like to point out. Um, and auditing is uh, based on space availability and the instructor uh, permission um, is required in, in order to audit a course. Um, another thing that senior guests or, or people like to hear about is the history of senior guest auditing. So I wanted to point that out, um, that in 1973, the Board of Regents approved um, a policy allowing cost-free auditing uh, for seniors 65 and older. And then when you fast forward to 1991, um, in through 2000, senior guests could audit, um, but they had to pay a per credit fee. Um, that fee was $42 in two, per credit in 2000. Um, the fee was initiated because um, an entrepreneur began promoting fee free classes at UW Madison to Florida citizens and would bust them up to Wisconsin. Um, and then, uh, and at the time, there was no residency requirement. Um, then in 2000, that was kind of reviewed again. Um, and there was a new uh, senior guest auditor policy developed. Um, so the Wisconsin State Legislature amended a Wisconsin statute um, and reflected by the Board of Regents uh, class audit policy to include a residency requirement um, for those age 60 plus to audit class um, classes for, for free, um, which kind of brings you to, to the same, I don't think that policy has really changed um, in 23 years. Um, and then to give you a little idea about how popular senior guest auditing is at UW Madison, uh, in 2012-2013 um, academic term, the uh, there was about 464 senior guests enrolled and 462 in the spring term. Uh, and then in fall 2022-23, this last term of academic year we just had, um, there's 883 enrolled. And, um, and then in spring, there were 850. Uh, enrolled means that they're actually taking at least one class. Um, we typically have more admitted senior guest auditors um, than enrolled. We probably about 1,100 admitted. Um, but depending on their situation, they may or may not have um, been able to audit a class they wanted or um, in the spring, we typically have less students because there's sometimes snowbirds or, or um, senior guys don't want to tackle the, the snow and, and getting to class and ice and all of that. So um, we typically have more senior guests in the fall term than um, in the spring term, and we could have, um, you know, about a, a thousand admitted at any time um, uh, during fall or spring term. So the big question that a lot of people ask are what courses well, are eligible to be audited, but what I like to point out are what courses are not available, typically available to audit. Um, and that is because it gives you that I don't have a list of classes that you can audit. <laughs> I just give you guys, I, we give guidelines as far as what classes are um, not typically available for audit. So foreign languages um, are not typically available. Um, a lot of, we get a lot of inquiries about class like Spanish and um, 
and uh, French and Italian and a class like that. Um, we also um, just recently UW um, has a American Sign Language class, so we've been getting people interested in that as well, but those um, would not be auditable. Um, studio and performing arts like uh, in music and writing and math are typically not uh, audible. Um, there's art lecture classes that might be, there's a couple of a semester that are auditable, but anything per, in participatory in nature are not going to be um, auditable. Um, use a class participating. There's some lectures, but not ones where you would participate. And then writing and math, writing is a little, would be a little challenging to not participate because it, you know, you're not able to hand in homework and in, in things to get the feedback. Um, math can be hit or miss because, um, you know, it depends on if you're, if you're brushing up on your math or you're trying to learn it. <laughs> so that, that's the two differentiate. If you're brushing up on math, sometimes um, the professors are fine. If you're actually trying to learn it, well, that's a little ch more challenging because um, you're, you wouldn't be able to hand in a homework and, and get feedback and, and, and that. Um, lab and discussion sections. Um, so sometimes we have lectures, I have a lab and lectures, I have a discussion. Um, those would not be auditable. Um, independent and directed study, um, seminar, research, and curricular courses, and then also courses that are part of a first year interest groups or any other courses that are part of a special cohort um, would not be auditable. So um, uh, here are some frequently asked eligibility and course questions that um, I kind of put together. Um, we also have an FAQ page on our website, which I'll discuss um, in a later slide. Um, but these are usually the ones that, that come up the most. Um, so what is the de definition of Wisconsin residency? And that would be um, in a kind of a broad term, um, because I can't really speak on behalf of the residency office, but um, the, in the broad terms, it is being a bona fide Wisconsin resident um, at least a year before the first term that you would like to audit. But in a bona fide um, Wisconsin resident would be um, having um, placement in Wisconsin um, at least a year before and, um, you know, pay taxes, um, voting, uh, having a driver's license or a car registered, you know, those are some of the examples of things that show proof that you are um, a Wisconsin resident. Um, but typically, if you're a resident for five years or more in Wisconsin, um, the residency questions, I mean, it, the residency portion of our application usually goes pretty quickly and goes right through. It's when it's like less than five years um, that may trigger some things in our residency office to ask a little bit more questions just to make sure that um, you qualify as a Wisconsin resident um, to audit for free. Um, uh, do you have to be a UW alum to audit? And um, that is no, uh, you do not have to be an alum of any UW system school. Um, we have people who, um, you know, have very high degrees uh, all the way to, um, you know, a high school diploma. Um, it, it, it's really open to anyone The just the two things is the 16 older and the residency requirement. Uh, do I have to take the prerequisites to audit a course? So um, when there are, you know, people are look through the classes and, and see, oh, I, I really want to do this class, but I don't have the prerequisites. Um, that is okay. Uh, the prerequisites are not you know, you don't have to take audit the class before it. Um, there, it's all prerequisites are only for the um, students who are going to be taking classes for credit. Um, that's the only requirement there. Um, what if I won't turn 60 until after the start of the term? Um, so if you're not 60 yet, um, then you would uh, and it, let's say even for those who turn 60, like in September, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to start until you actually turn 60 before the start of the term that you would like to audit. Um, so we, if you, some people apply a little early, and then if depending on when that is, um, we can usually defer the application one semester for them, or um, if they talk to us, we'll, we explain that if they can pulled off for just one more semester, um, and then they they could um, fill that out and um, apply. Uh, if I'm under 60 uh, and receive SSI or SSDI, can I audit for free? And that answer is yes. 
um, are, you would apply instead of as a senior guest auditor, it would be a guest auditor. And then you would, our office would just need a letter, not with just name, no details, no um, personal information as far as amounts, anything like that. Just a letter basically from SSI or SSDI explaining that you do receive benefits um, and then we can um, waive your tuition. Um, so that is one way to audit for free um, uh, in Wisconsin. If you wanted to audit um, under age 60 and, and you were under age 60 in your Wisconsin residents, um, it's around $103 of credit to audit. So just, just give you a little bit of an idea. If you're not a Wisconsin resident, it's, it's um, pretty high and usually not cost effective to um, audit. Um, are online courses auditable? And um, the short answer to that is uh, yes, um, but it is still at the, um, you would still have to get permission from the instructor in order to, um, in order to audit, audit the class. Um, and so, uh, and, and so then, so, so not all online classes are audible is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's gonna depend on, on the professor. Um, and even though it is online, sometimes um, professors um, don't, um, you know, it can vary sometimes as, um, you know, whether or not something would be auditable or not. It's really at the, um, at the discretion of the professor or the department. Um, can I audit graduate level courses? Um, I will say in my experience um, working at uh, office for about nine years now, um, graduate level is, it, it is possible people have audited graduate level classes. Um, and, and in the permission form that we have senior guests fill out, we do have a spot for people to put in like why they're interested in a class. Um, so I always encourage people to fill that out, but especially with graduate level, um, there are uh, senior guests who have experience in an area um, of the, you know, um, that graduate area. And so they would like to kind of keep keep their skills up or or stay in the loop on what's going on, even though they're retired. Uh, so what I tell senior guests is, you know, make sure you explain that yes, I have a background in that in that area. Um, this is why I'm asking to um, request a higher, you know, uh, to audit a higher level class. Otherwise, if you don't have any experience in that field, it can it can get kind of high up in the um, or get into the weeds <laughs> a little bit more and it might be um, a little a little difficult to to like follow and um, uh, lecture at graduate level that and and sometimes those cohorts the graduate classes are quite small so it might actually not be real conducive to auditing depending on how the class is set up if it's more participatory in nature that kind of thing um, once I'm enrolled in a class, can I participate? And again, um, like I mentioned in the last slide, um, that's going to depend on the on the professor. But basically, what we say is the 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 um, expectation is to go in, kind of be a fly on the wall, sit in the back, um, and then it. But sometimes the professors will be like, "I want everyone to participate," but we just like to to um, have. Uh, to point out that um, the classes are, it's important for the undergraduates or, or the, the degree students um, to be front and center and, and for them to, um, you know, make sure that they're getting the most out of, the, out of, their, out of their class. Um, but that being said, um, you know, for example, there's been people who have audited, um, you know, um, the classes uh, like Vietnam Wars, for example, and that's a class where um, the professor would encourage participation from the uh, from the senior guest auditors because they've lived through that, and that was a great way for the students to hear firsthand um, that those experiences and, and living through um, certain certain um, things in history, even. So uh, that's a really great learning experience for the students. So it, it it can be it can just vary a little bit. Um, all right. And then, um, so the big thing is um, how to get started. So um, we, uh, so the big, the one thing that I want to emphasize is that um, our uh, application is open now and will close on August 23rd. Um, so if you are interested in auditing and you think you're, you're 60 plus and you're, uh, and you are at the, um, we qualify as a Wisconsin resident. Um, you can go to our website 
Um, you can go to the ACSSS website, um, there acsss.wis.edu. Um, and then um, from the drop down, you'll see become a student. You could select senior guest auditing there and that'll get you this screen, or you could type in this link. Um, you can also just do a Google search for UW Madison senior guests, and it should a link should pop up that you should be able to get to um, the senior guest auditing webpage. Um, and then um, if you're new to senior guest auditing, you can start um, with reviewing the guidelines um, and, uh, and the steps to auditing. We are also um, going to shortly have a video that does an overview of guest auditing. It's not going to be in the quite as the detail in as much detail as I give you today, but if this has been a lot of information and in a couple of weeks you come back to it and you're like, wait, I just want to kind of get a quick overview of senior guest auditing again. You could select that video. It has um, it's going to be a video with our two front office staff, <laughs> um, and so um, they did an amazing job on it. So uh, um, you could do an overview of that. Um, or if you have a friend or somebody you know that's interested in auditing, um, you could certainly send to us our website and then a good place to start will be that video. Um, I also wanted to point out um, just the different links that we have. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of write a lot, quite a few things. So um, the Adult Career and um, Special Student Services Office, that's our website. The Badger Ready Program that I was telling you about, that's another um, website if you want to check out more about, um, you know, with the students that are, um, you know, have been in that program. Uh, the Returning Adult uh, Non-Traditional and Single Parent Student Scholarships. Um, and then what's really neat is we have an annual celebration of outstanding adult students. Um, these again are degree seeking students that have received um, awards for being an outstanding adult student who have received scholarships from our office and also Badger Ready students. And it's a great way to celebrate those students and hear their stories. Um, and then if you're interested in donating to any of the, um, you know, if you feel passionate about returning adult students in general and want to help out, um, uh, you know, there's definitely the need there given that returning adult students, um, you know, Madison is not traditional, uh, you know, it's a traditional school, I should say. So it doesn't um, have the evening and the nights and weekends and things that are more compatible to returning adult students. So um, we, with that, um, they, they usually need a lot of, a lot of help and we're very fortunate in our office that we have, um, some scholarships available. Um, and then if you're interested in, in st starting a scholarship for returning adult students or non-traditional students or single parents, we have a, a double development director, um, named Troy Olick. Um, he's great. And, or you could contact me as well. Okay. And then we, here's my information. Um, and then the Adult Career and Special Student Services Office, um, those are the two front end staff um, that I work with. Um, they are amazing and they will be able to answer any questions you might have, you have questions about the process of applying, um, all the steps for, um, you know, uh, there are several steps. Um, but we, are, like, I'd like to emphasize that we are here every step of the way to, you know, help senior guest auditors, myself, um, the front end staff, when the, um, when the office, when, when it gets closer to, to, to the beginning of the term, it's kind of all hands on deck. <laughs> so we're here to help. We're here to, you know, if a person isn't good on computers, we can, we can send out a paper application, um, you know, things like that. So we really do try to accommodate um, everybody at every level, um, as far as trying to make it accessible um, to everyone um, that, um, you know, when they come in and, and want to apply to become a senior guest. Um, oh, and, uh, and that is everything I believe. Um, yeah, I can leave the screen up if there's any questions. I don't know if you usually do like a QA and a at the end of your webinars or not. Yeah, and uh, certainly appreciate that. And uh, we we can uh, give it a few minutes for questions, but before I move into that, just for those watching in the future of this recording, I'm just gonna to end mm -hmm. that. So appreciate you you're mm -hmm. listening uh, uh, live into the recording, and yeah. uh, I am going to hit stop now. Okay.